In this unit, we're going to study the chemistry of alkyl halides, which are compounds containing tetrahedral carbon, sp3 hybridized, linked to a halogen atom. And we'll focus mostly on alkyl chlorides, bromides, and iodides, as in the reactions that we'll dig into, alkyl fluorides are relatively unreactive, while the other alkyl halides are much more reactive. Specifically, we're going to look at nucleophilic substitution reactions and elimination reactions of alkyl halides. We'll see why this class of substrates is particularly well suited to these two reaction types because alkyl halides contain a built-in good leaving group. We'll study their mechanisms, their stereochemical course, some regiochemical issues with elimination, and by the end of this unit we'll look at an interesting situation where substitution and elimination are competing with each other. This is quite common in reactions of alkyl halides because the reagents we use for nucleophilic substitutions and eliminations in, in many cases are the same and we'll be able to generally predict when substitution or elimination will predominate. <coughs> <clears throat> so we're going to start with the general structures of alkyl halides and learn to recognize them along with their sort of cousins, the alkyl sulfonates. These are analogs of sulfuric acid on some level that react very similarly to alkyl halides because they too contain a built-in good leaving group. We'll then dig into the reactivity of alkyl halides and sulfonates, focusing first on nucleophilic substitution, or SN, reactions. In any SN reaction, we'll be able to identify the nucleophile and leaving group, and doing this will enable us to predict the organic product of SN reactions. We'll also study the mechanisms of these reactions and learn that there are two sort of limiting cases of mechanisms that can take place. There's the SN2 elementary step, a single step mechanism, and there's SN1, which is down here at learning objective seven. We'll also study elimination reactions, learning to recognize the acidic protons involved in these eliminations of alkyl halides as well as the leaving group and similarly to learning objective two here with nucleophilic substitutions, by identifying the acidic proton in the leaving group, we'll be able to predict the products of elimination reactions with ease. We'll look at the mechanisms of elimination, both the bimolecular mechanism, single step E2 reaction, and the two step E1 mechanism for elimination. And we'll learn in predicting the products of eliminations to apply stability trends of alkenes to make conclusions about the regiochemical outcome of the reaction, which particular alkene is formed when multiple are possible, and the stereochemical implications of E2 in particular, which has an interesting stereochemical requirement that affects the configuration of the alkene product in cases where we could get a cis or a trans, a Z or an E alkene. The SN1 and E1 reactions tend to occur under acidic or neutral conditions, and we'll learn to draw mechanisms for these and recognize them, and apply the same ideas as we did for the SN2 and E2 reactions, stability trends of alkenes. Unique to the E1 and SN1 mechanisms are carbocation rearrangements, which can complicate the structures of our products. And then finally, we'll ultimately develop some heuristics for predicting whether a given set of reaction conditions and substrate will result in SN2, E2, SN1, or E1, allowing us to distinguish both between when nucleophilic and substitution and elimination will occur and when the mechanism will be bimolecular and unimolecular. Alkyl halides contain an sp3 hybridized tetrahedral carbon linked to a halogen atom. And that tetrahedral carbon may have three hydrogens, in which case we're looking at a methyl halide, two hydrogens, in which case we're looking at a primary, one hydrogen is a secondary, and no hydrogens is a tertiary alkyl halide. And alkyl halides are good electrophiles at this carbon highlighted in green connected directly to the halogen atom. The reason they are is that the halogen itself is a good leaving group. We'll touch on this at the bottom of the slide, except for fluorine. So we generally will not look at alkyl fluorides in this unit because they tend to be unreactive in these substitution and elimination reactions. Nucleophilic substitution involves the displacement of a leaving group, which appears on the product side as X minus, by a nucleophile. This is a classic nucleophilic substitution. And when the substrate is an alkyl halide, the leaving group is a halide anion, and for chlorine, bromine, and iodine. That's the conjugate base of a strong acid, very stable anion. So these reactions are very important for alkyl halides. 
At the same time, however, this nucleophile can also function as a Bronsted base. And that can occur in particular at these carbons that are one carbon away from X. The so-called beta carbons, if we think of this as alpha and this as beta, the beta hydrogens can be deprotonated by the basic reagent to give an alkene. And this is what's known as an elimination reaction. And because the base is just something with, for example, a reactive pair of electrons that wants to be donated to H, is the same as a nucleophile on some level, which just happens to be donating to carbon. It's the same chemical species that can serve in these two roles. And so these two modes of reactivity, substitution and elimination, often compete with one another in the same reaction flask. The reason alkyl halides are so well suited to substitution and elimination reaction reactions is that X is a good leaving group. It wants to depart with a pair of electrons. And when it does so, it forms a relatively stable anion when X is chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And so in some reactions, we'll actually see the formation of carbocations as an elementary step in the mechanism. But even if a discrete carbocation doesn't form, a nucleophile can still be inclined to come in here and displace or kick off the leaving group, forming the nucleophile R bond at the same time as the leaving group departs. In both cases, we see this kind of ele uh, electron flow with the carbon X bond breaking towards X, forming a halide anion. More generally, what makes a good leaving group? A leaving group, if we think of that as the anion X minus that's given off after this bond cleavage toward X, a good leaving group is the conjugate base of a strong acid, HX. A strong acid has a pKa less than zero. So if we think of the conjugate acid HX, if its pKa is negative, we're looking at a good leaving group in X minus. And from a structural point of view, this means that the negative charge in the leaving group is profoundly stabilized. This might be by electronegativity, it might be by resonance, it might be by both, these kinds of things. And that anion is an extremely weak base and generally a, a, a weak Bronsted base and Lewis base. It's very stable with negative charge. So things like I minus, Br minus, Cl minus, these are fantastic leaving groups. This is the toluene sulfonate anion, which is a fantastic leaving group as well, an analog of sulfuric acid in which this aromatic group has replaced the, the OH and bisulfate, right, the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. Leaving groups can also be neutral. If, for example, we start with a cation, something like OH2+, for example, connected to some carbon group, R group, this water fragment can act as a leaving group like this. And this leads to a neutral leaving group. And again, assuming the conjugate acid has a pKa less than zero, we're looking at a good leaving group. And in fact, water is right there on the edge. Hydronium has a pKa of zero. And so steps like this, where the neutral leaving group H2O departs from a cation with positive charge in the oxygen atom, are quite common as well. Bad leaving groups are the conjugate bases of relatively weak acids. F minus, OH minus, these are two that you should really keep in mind are not good leaving groups. OR minuses and of course N minus and C minus and H minus are horrendously bad leaving groups and in introductory courses and pretty much throughout organic chemistry you do not see carbon and hydrogen acting as leaving groups pretty much ever. We won't talk too much here about the nomenclature of alkyl halides, but there is a very important general convention that I wanted to mention, classifying alkyl halides based on their substitution pattern, the number of R groups, the number of alkyl groups connected to the carbon that bears the halide. Here we see three examples of general alkyl chlorides with different substitution patterns. In the first molecule, we've got two hydrogens and an R group connected to this carbon that bears the chlorine. The one R group makes this a primary alkyl halide. With two R groups and one hydrogen, which is the case that we have here, we're looking at a secondary alkyl chloride. And in this third case, we have three R groups and no hydrogens connected to the carbon bearing the chlorine. This is a tertiary alkyl chloride. Methyl substrates are also worth noting. Methyl chloride would look like this. And we just refer to this as, as methyl. It's not the same as primary. 
right? Because in a primary alkyl halide, we've got only two hydrogens. A methyl chloride, or methyl halide more generally, has three. We care about this substitution pattern of alkyl halides for two reasons. Number one, there are steric differences, spatial differences between primary, secondary, and tertiary halides. Tertiary alkyl halides are very crowded, generally around this carbon linked to the halogen. A lot of R groups, a lot of CH bonds, and so on and so forth in the vicinity of this carbon makes these very sterically encumbered or sterically crowded, we might say. Carbyl cation stability is the other reason we care about substitution pattern. We've seen that more substituted carbocations are more stable than less substituted carbocations. And on the last slide, we noted that carbocations are very easy to generate from alkyl halides via loss of a leaving group like this. And so more substituted alkyl halides generally give rise to more stable carbocations and faster reactions in which those reactive intermediates, carbocations, appear. Generally, we name alkyl halides using halo prefixes, thinking of the halogen as a substituent, so chloro, bromo, iodo. They can also be named, though, as alkyl halides, methyl chloride, ethyl bromide, propyl iodide, etc. And we generally will see alkyl halides. These are pretty reactive compounds quite frequently, so they're not super common in everyday life. They're often quite toxic. Some of them have been used as insecticides, and some examples are shown here. Things like DDT, chlordane, and even methyl bromide itself has been used as an insecticide. Because of this propensity of the halogen to depart with a pair of electrons, nucleophilic substitution and elimination reactions are the most common reactants of alkyl halides by far. And they're valuable synthetic precursors because a wide variety of nucleophiles can be used in these reactions to substitute for the halogen atom. So via substitution reactions, we can get things like alcohols using hydroxide as a nucleophile, ethers using alkoxides, thiols using SH-, esters using carboxylate nucleophiles, nitriles using cyanide, and so on and so forth. This is actually just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to nucleophilic substitutions of alkyl halides. When we use a uh, an ionic compound, an ionic compound inclined to act as a Bronsted base, elimination is the major reaction path. And there we get alkenes. And these two are synthetically valuable. We'll look at reactions later in the course of alkenes where we add even more functionality to the compound after the reaction of the alkene. So nucleophilic substitution and elimination reactions really are going to enlarge our synthetic toolbox and really be the first and a very important tool in our synthetic toolbox for building carbon-containing compounds.